Welcome to the FESPA Sustainability Spotlight video series. We all understand that sustainability is uh, future, the future of business success and drives um, us in reducing negative environmental and societal impact that's essential to our communities. We're providing information with the help of our guest speakers, thank you, Steve, uh, that will support environmental best practice to enable you to make more progress on your journey. Uh, in today's video, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Steve Lister, uh, who many of you will know of uh, as a sustainability consultant to global brands and retailers. I could go on, but I'm not going to. I'm going to let Steve tell us a bit more about himself and, and your background. So, Steve, welcome and over to you. Brilliant. Thank you, Graham. And thank you for giving the opportunity to participate um, today. Um, yeah, um, if you don't know me, um, I've been in sustainability for about 16, 17 years. I currently run um, a global uh, sustainability consultancy called stevelister.com. And we offer uh, uh, sustainable services um, back to global brands and retailers. Yeah, um, I'm. I'm also. And we'll we'll discuss that a little bit further. But I'm also head of sustainability for Popeye, the Point of Purchase Association, uh, of which I do that on a voluntary role and have done that for uh, nearly ten years. So we work with many of the global brands and retailers who are um, looking at sustainability and helping to try and navigate their way through some of the biggest challenges that they're facing at the moment. And um, I've been very lucky over the last sort of like few weeks, I've just been announced as uh, one of the retail tech uh, influence, influencers for 2023. And also Rethink Retailers uh, just announced that I'm one of their top retail influencers also for 2023. So the last 17 years of hard work focusing on sustainability has finally paid off. Nice. It's good to, it's nice to have an accolade when, you, um, when you're dedicated to the cause, isn't it? That's it great. It is, yeah. Okay, so in um, our discussion today, we're going to focus on circular design thinking um, and the importance of creating a circular design process. So I think there's, I've got a few kind of areas that I'd like to get into with you, Steve, and, sure. and maybe we can, maybe we can kick off by establishing a, a definition of what what we mean by circular design thinking yeah and, and that's a good place to start because one thing we've i see all the time graham is is people have slight different definitions and um sometimes it's quite confusing and, and hopefully i can uh you know help us like you know through those sort of like terminologies and navig navigation so if we just go back to where we were a few years ago and actually unfortunately in some countries we're still there um, so if you've never heard of the terminology, uh, a linear model, and, and, and what I mean by that is, is I'll, I'll explain it, is um, we used to take minerals or take materials, take trees, turn them into paper, or you'd take uh, other different minerals, turn them into plastics or, 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 or metals and glass, etc. So we would take it, we would make it, and then once we used it, we didn't really have a lot to do with it, really, because recycling mechanisms weren't there. So we just landfilled them we would I you know would send them to landfill. So it was that linear process of taking something, making something, and then basically throwing it away. Um, but that evolved. And what we saw was over um the you know many years, but we, we come to sort of like the recycling model. Um, and we all do it now. We all take it for granted that we will take those uh, base materials, we'll make it into a product. Um, and then we have mechanisms where we will recycle it. And now it's well established. Hey, look, we all recycle at home now. I mean, how many bins do we have? We've got brown bins. We've got blue bins. We've got black bins. We've got food waste bins. So it's embedded now in our sort of like in our societies. And it's also actually embedded to a certain extent in industrial commercial elements. And we can touch on that later. So we now we then had a route of making something, launching it, putting it out into the marketplace. And then collecting it and recycling it as much as we can. We've been doing it with bottles and cans and glass for many, many years. And there's a bit of waste. So what really now, uh, Graham, people are talking about is moving towards the circular model. And the circular model is now more around starting at that beginning point. And maybe we could talk about it a little bit later about defining materials, et cetera. But if we just focus here, that we take that, we make it into something. But now we're starting to talk about returns, P 
picking things up, recycling it, um, maybe refurbishing it, maybe making it back into another product of exactly what it used to be. Now that's truly circular. But what we're also now finding is people are sort of then taking different materials and then at least not putting them into landfill, making them into products that have a second life, a third life. The more know, of a cyclical economy. Rather than really yeah. So creating that cycle, that, that circular model where you can start at the top with the material and then it's infinitely recycled back into itself and back into itself and back into other products. So again, so just to summarize that piece is the linear model was just linear, make it and throw it away. The circular model now is much more circular in the approach of saying, find it, get it back, collect it, refurb it, manufacture it into something else and recycle it again and again and again. Okay, cool. So when we think about print and packaging, um, can you give us your explanation as to what we need to consider to be a good circular design process and, and kind of what it looks like? Um, yeah, um, a, a good question. Because when we look at it's complex. If you look at our, our, our industry and our sectors, if you look at print and packaging, we use a huge variety of materials. You know, people might just go, well, it's not. It's paper, it's fibre and it's plastic. It's just dead easy. It's two. But underneath each one of those, it's actually quite complicated. Um, and it's actually more complicated than sort of we we really understand at the beginning. So what you have to do is you sort of have to give yourself a structure. Um, and um, I am a huge advocate of, of circular design thinking and circularity really always starts with design. Um, now, there's lots of people who will say it should start with material choices, but I believe that comes next. So for me, design and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, um, uh, they did a report which said 80% of the sustainable environmental impact of any product or service is determined at the early design stage. So what they really meant there, uh, Graham, was if you get it wrong at the beginning, if you design sustainability out at the beginning, you'll never get it right. You'll never be able to recover. Yeah, it's, it, it's going to be wrong. And we see lots of examples of things that are wrong that can never be recycled. And you look at it and you think, well, why has that ever been designed? Well, it was all right for yesterday's linear model. It's not for today and tomorrow's circular model. So you asked me about a process. I would say there are some particular life cycle elements that we have to think about. And it, and it all starts with me in design. So if you look at design, the next stage is materials. So we have to look at what materials we're using in print and in packaging, you know, because they've got to be functional. They've got to have some form of longevity. It could be food packaging. It could be clothes packaging. Um, um, and if you look at print, well, there's a longevity of life. Some uh, uh, books and displays and, 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 and guides, they need to be out there for years and years. So so those are the sorts of things that you have to look at with those materials. And so then you then have durability is a kind of a... You're right. Yeah. So, so, how long so does, to, it, does it actually need to last rather than how long can it last? It's how long is it necessary to last? There, there, there it is. And, and what I've done, I'm going to come back to that in a moment because okay. that that's a fascinating one. Um, only because um, I was speaking to a client the other day who was doing a promotion that was going to be um, for 48 hours. It was over a weekend period and they were making everything in plastic. And I was like, hmm, OK, hold a second. Why shouldn't you be using fibre? Fibre is easily recyclable at the back of these stores. It, it's not really going to get rained on over a 24 hour period. You don't really have to worry about durability and, and that. And the functionality can be replaced by plastic, by fibre. And it made them think about that. And so so when you get to that manufacturing step, that's when you sort of have to start thinking, how are we going to make it? What's the longevity of life? What's the function of it? Because you still have to have functionality. Um, and then at the end of it, we do real st still, uh, Graham, have to think about where is it going to be uh, distributed? What are the logistics? How is it going to be used? And you bring up a really, really good point there. So what's the use of the product? And then crucially, you get to end of life. And that's sometimes where it can get a little bit confusing because recyclability is a challenge. Um, and we all might sit here and go, well, no, it's not. It's dead easy. You collect something, you recycle something. But recycling's not as easy as that um there are huge issues around the world with recycling rates and i'm just going to chuck a few a few things at you um if you go to holland if you go to belgium 
And Germany, they class recycling as waste to energy, incineration, whatever you want to call it. They call that recycling. So all of their numbers look really, really good. The worst country in Europe for recycling is, unfortunately, it's Turkey. They, it's around about 12% of their waste is, is recycled. The rest of it is pretty much burnt or landfilled. Um, uh, so we've got challenges, but they're this key life cycle steps. There are some key life cycle steps of where you look at it from design materials to manufacturing um, to distribution logistics and then back to end of life. Okay, cool. Um, so, so the challenges that... Um, that exists to have a true circular design process. Um, are there any other issues that we need to kind of consider? Yeah, there, there, there is. There, there's many. So if I'd sort of like just expand on just a couple of those is um, I, some of the words people are using now is cyclability, about the cycle of, of, of it. And it's sort of like designing with the end use in mind right at the beginning and thinking through that whole product design process will help with the circularity at the end because we need to avoid waste because if we can eliminate waste actually that's really good practice as well because people always say to me if i can eliminate waste it makes me more profitable yeah. so there's a profit thing here as well this isn't just about being sustainable and uh, uh, and there's actually a good business case for avoiding waste it makes you more efficient um and then you then look at things like disassembly and 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 like green chemistry. You know, we should be thinking about the chemicals that we use. You know, what inks are we using in our print processes? You know, how do we dispose of those inks? Um, and I, and I think interestingly, when it comes to things like ink, is it's you know we know that water based is a is a shortcut in terms of oh that's sustainable, but we also have to consider the energy used to cure inks and the efficiency. Yeah process and i think i think you're right that that point about reviewing and considering the processes we use and the products that we manufacture actually energy is a massive component of of the emissions of any product and just by thinking through the system design it gets you to that point of actually putting money back in the bank and 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 i think i think when when you know, if you look at all the people, we we got some wonderful companies in our sector. I mean, I'm still blown away by the creativity and the innovation that I see within print uh, uh, and 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 um, and packaging. I love it. I always have loved it. I'm still enthusiastic as the day I joined, walked into this industry, you know, 17 odd years ago. Um, but I think when people understand that sustainability can also bring huge benefits, financial benefits as well, profitability benefits. And also sort of like loyalty benefits with with clients, I think people will get it. And I think people, once they start, like you said, you know, maybe the next choice of print equipment will be based on um, energy consumption. In the past, we didn't really think about one printing device or one device over another device based upon um, the energy consumption. But now it's real in focus, you know, with the energy costs going the way they've gone. Of course, if we're running a print print device, whatever size it is, for eight hours, ten hours, twelve hours, double shifting in twenty four, treble shifting three out three you know three times a day, twenty four hours a day. Think of what what the costs are going to be. So those considerations are going to be made if they're not being made already. I am sure if you're a business owner, you must be looking at any cons- energy consumptions of of one unit against another unit. If you're not. I think people should start to do that. And the same with inks. You know, we've seen some great developments in uh, vegetable-based inks and latex-based inks. You know, the market's changed over those years, Graham. Hey, look, you must have seen that, you know, you know, with these new developments and, and low energy curing, you know, and, and vegan inks. And that will be continued to, the, the, the big print um, the companies will continue to innovate. And I think they will continue to innovate based on sustainable uh, sort of like, uh, you know, benefits. So, okay, so we've kind of, we know that this is coming. We know the principle of the polluter pays is, is coming. We know that legislation is likely to follow. So there is there is going to be a punitive impact if, yeah. if we don't get our heads in the game, if we don't start. So I think our viewers would, would really value getting an understanding from you as to 
where to start in terms you know you said that design is the yeah the the first creation is the point at which you can determine the the full life cycle of a product so can you talk to us a bit about getting started yeah i mean for for, for me i would actually say to people do you have a sustainable design process when you start right at the beginning is sustainability actually one of the metrics you use right at the beginning now of course loads of people are going to turn around and go well if the client doesn't demand it we're not gonna you know we're just going to continue what we're doing and actually i think that should be the opposite i think you should be embedding it right now because then the customer will go wow you're thinking this right up front so i would look at it and go be take it as a commercial advantage over a competitor why shouldn't you have a really robust open transparent design process where you can sit down with a client and say right this is how we make material choices okay we select um low impact materials um for, and might have pre and um, post consumer waste in it it still could be plastic still could be fiber um, could you imagine saying in front of a customer, um, and we've started to look at the CO2 impact of each of these materials um, and production, all of a sudden you're speaking the client's language. They're all under, all these big global brands and retailers are all under, you know, huge pressure to lower their CO2, you know. So if you could go to them and say, I can print on this material and I can print on this. And basically this has a higher CO2 than this one. All of a sudden you're answering a lot of questions and a lot of challenges that retailer has uh, or that brand has. So, you know, I, I can't sort of say to, you know, go on about it too much is have a really good, robust design strategy. Be passionate about it. Understand those materials. There is some incredible su material suppliers out there, you know, challenge them, ask them what they've got see those materials coming in and then start working out how you can create that process where when you go back to the back, back to your your clients and if you're pitching for new business you can start a conversation which maybe they've never had before but one thing i will say is yeah. i i'm a sustainable realist i understand that all the businesses that will be listening to this have to balance their their, their the cost versus quality and functionality fun here i get that I understand that if you're going to go to a client and say, I've got a sustainable option, that's 20% more. Commercially, a lot of people are going to go, I can't sell that, Steve. You know, I won't be able to put my prices up by that much. And that's where the challenge then lies, is can you find materials that are at a price parity? Can you manufacture them in a different way? Can you design waste out of it, which makes you more profitable, which means you might be able to balance the, the, some of these materials out. So... I hope that answers your question. It, but for me, it, it's it, about it, that design part. It does. Um, and I think, yeah, it is about taking a, a deeper look. And and actually, one of the things that just sprung to my mind is, of course, we're now seeing um, management information systems for quoting and estimating with carbon footprint calculating calculation built in. Absolutely. If, if you can, uh, and to part of your what materials you select and how you represent the value of that material. So I can't remember the the average kind of uh, ratio of scope three emissions in terms of businesses overall carbon footprint. I think it's like 70, 80%, isn't it? Oh, like I think you're I think you're right. I, look, I'm sure there's some life cycle analysis people and some sustainable consultants out there who who deal in just carbon who would probably say, oh no, it's 72.4. But you're about right. It's about 70, 80 percent of, of, of all of that sits in scope three, which is suppliers, which is us, which yeah. is the print industry, which is the packaging yeah. industry. So could you imagine, Graham, your biggest client coming to you next week and going, right, can you give me your carbon disclosure uh, uh, certificate with uh, and that you've measured, measured all of your scope one, scope two carbon emissions, please? And can you can I have it this afternoon? Because because they need to report on it. I, I, I think there would be collective panic within our sector if some of the brands and retailers started to ask for carbon footprinting. But I want to I want to come back quickly to what you just said because you bring up you you bring up a great point there, Graham. Is I've seen some fantastic sustainable pieces of technology where people are embedded in, into the MIS systems, the managing information systems, where people are starting to now at quote level 
at quoting level, people are now starting to have an automated CO2 analysis of, of what they're doing. Now, that's a game changer. That's when all of a sudden sustainability is at quote level and that's the initial conversation and that's where it should start. So I think we're going to see a lot more of this being introduced. And I know there are a few companies that are doing it at the moment, you know, and I've got to say, I think if people haven't got an MIS system that has CO2 uh, measurement embedded into it, I think they better get it pretty quick, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's, there's great opportunity and there's, and it's about value, isn't it? It's about yeah. if I can say to you that this product B has 50% lower emissions than product A, even if product B is a bit more expensive, it may just be that the reduction in CO2 emissions is sufficiently interesting yes. to move the conversation away from, well, I won't pay for it. But, but if you can't explain it, you yep. can't present it as a as value, can you? And that's that's you, a thing where and, where and, the kind of real the the really interesting development of 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 integrated uh, footprinting presents this uh, this great chance and, for people. And then and then to link that back to to what we're talking about today is then all of a sudden brands and retailers and people could start to see the the CO two decrease when it comes to circularity and circular materials. Because obviously you're not taking uh, uh, virgin materials, you're utilizing materials that have had a life before. So it's going to start. That's going to be really interesting because we're going to start seeing decisions on print and packaging being made on maybe the way it's manufactured, where it's manufactured. You know, will start. Will people start making decisions about uh, uh, their purchases being in country? rather than oh i can make something cheap abroad i can go to i don't know south america i can go to eastern europe i can go to china maybe the co2 footprint is going to be too big to be going there anymore and maybe that will force people to come and have their production in country maybe discussions will be held about how are you going to reduce my landfill how are you going to increase recycling rates i want you to create a circular design uh, process for the materials i'm purchasing from you these are all questions that are already being asked, Graham, by these global brands and retailers. And I think the industry, there are some pioneers out there, but I think the industry is going to have to accelerate themselves into this circular thinking and, and thinking around utilising materials a bit better. And I suppose it, it, all in all, it just points to the fact that we have long considered our economic performance as being our only priority, whereas now we're saying now consumers are pushing brands to say okay so that's great that you produce this lovely product but where are you producing it how are you producing it and what's what are the what are the impacts that you're not telling me that kind yeah. of consideration is is behind all of this isn't it and it, yeah it, it is and and uh, and i've been saying this on a, on a couple of other uh, um, uh, interviews i've been doing in some white papers is people always say to me so what is 2023, uh, Steve? If, if if you're one of these influencers and you're future looking, you know, what is it? And I'm like, transparency. 2023, 24 is going to be the years of transparency. And what I mean by that is we're going to have to be very open and very honest about the materials, where they're coming from. I mean, I've even started hearing, hearing from some brands that are starting to say, I want to know the GPS coordinates of the forest that the fibre came from. And, yeah. and that's going to fundamentally change the conversation around the paper the paper mills you know all of the materials that we currently use you know paper mills and paper companies have been doing this for, for many many years through accreditations like fsc yeah. what about the plastics industry the plastic industry has never mapped where the chemicals come from where the plastics being made where all the polymers are being shipped from that's going to be a big eye opener when that may be focused that the paper and pulp industry has been is been embedded in there for years when it's going to get passed over to the plastics industry uh, and are they, and an, and another segment where it's happening is is fashion you know the the yeah. the supply chain you know the use of rfid tagging the there's there's i think a way to go I was in another conversation I was having we were talking about uh traceability and, and actually the possibility of you know what did the digital production enables is the chance to 
can buy a shirt with a label with a QR code in it that takes you back to report as to who made it, where it was made and what it was made from. And and that is not science fiction. That is now. Well, funny, funny, you should bring funny you should bring that up. And hey, look, I didn't even know you're going to bring that up. I mean, you know, yesterday I was at the retail technology show in London and yeah. I was just passing a stand and they were talking about RFID uh, chips and they've made these new RFID ones out of paper that still had the printed uh, circuit in. And then when I picked up the product, it was a pair of shorts. And in the short, in the back of the shorts was this QR code with the RFID in. Okay. I scanned it and it told me where it was manufactured, where, right. the cotton, okay. where the cotton came from, you know, how many litres of water were, 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 were consumed to make those shorts and what was the community behind it, you know. And all of a sudden, I was instantly connected to the product. And I was instantly then also connected to the packaging and the print of it because they were putting this was the packaging. This is how it was made. This is how it's picked and packed and shipped. And this is our uh, this is the, how we've uh, uh, colored the actual fibers of the, of these shorts. So all of a sudden, back to what I just said, all of a sudden you've got instant trans, uh, 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 transparency across the supply chain. So that was very, very interesting for me to see yesterday that yeah. actually someone is now doing it. And, and it has so many other benefits attached to, you know, RFID. If you can track your, um, for logistics, you know, you know, if you can, the scanning in and out of um, of hubs, if you can do it contactless without, yes. you know, the, the, it is absolutely going to be everywhere. And, and it's why I think RFID is being has been developed in, you know, with gravure printing, with very, very high volume print production methodology and very, very low cost because fundamentally it's going to be on almost everything. It, it, it will do. And what was very interesting the other day, I even saw the other day RFID with uh, uh, barcodes on the same label. So it had, it had a barcode for scanning to pay for it and then next to it was uh was the qr code and rfid for all of the transparency so all of a sudden it's all going to be encapsulated into one maybe you know uh, one piece of technology then like you said you've got transparency you've got stock you've got logistics you've got also counterfeiting so you can start to work out whether something is a genuine product or not then then who's bought it how many owners of those shorts had if they, it then gets moved on to someone else and it, 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 I've got to say, sustainability we is at the heart. We should not even get started on blockchain, should we, at this point? No, should we leave that one to another day? Uh, that another time. If um, So if you have a, a couple of final thoughts and key takeaways, uh, what would they be in summary, briefly? Um, just briefly, for me, I, I, I've, I've been banging on about this, but I just say it's about collaboration. You know, do you know what? Individually, we can't do this. You know, um, so so the first thing I would say is um, please, please collaborate with all of your st different stakeholders and supply chain partners because they're all wanting to do it. But I, in isolation, it's going to be very, very difficult. So I would say collaboration is the key. And then the second uh, part of that would be um, communicating it. How do you communicating it? How, how do you communicate it? And I just want to give a uh, just a final thought. Um, so David Attenborough said, um, saving our planet is now a communications challenge. And he and, and 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 I totally agree with it because we've got the scientists, we've got the data, we've got a lot of technologies, but it's how we then communicate all of that. So for me, my final thought would be collaboration is key and how we communicate it is also the way we're going to connect it, not just with consumers, but how we can communicate it effortlessly as well. Perfect. All right. Thank you very much. What a great, um, what a great discussion! I've really enjoyed this. Um, so that's uh, that concludes this uh, video. And you know, Steve, thank you so much. I'm looking forward to our next conversation. Um, but in the meantime, if you're if you're managing to get to Munich to the the Festival Global Print Expo, uh, there will be the Sustainability Spotlight um, displayed there. That's going to have useful information on the the processes and thinking in sustainability and also we have a a feature of all sorts of new uh, materials that are more sustainable than the established um materials that we've been used to so 
uh, come and take a look if you're if you're at the show. Uh, if not, please um, come and have a look at Vespa.com where there'll be lots of videos, uh, blogs and podcasts from a host of interesting people that will allow you to, you know, become more aware and and get your get your um programs going if uh if you're yet to begin or hopefully if you're already in it we'll give you some useful pointers on the way so you know our mission to reduce reuse and recycle is ongoing um let's uh let's get involved so thank you very much indeed cheers <laughs>